Welcome to a Soames Heritage Area presentation on plagues, Poconocets, and pilgrims in the 17th century. I'm Dr. David Weed, and I'll be your host as we explore the role that infectious disease played in 17th century New England. It's well known that plagues have played a crucial role throughout history. Whether it's the biblical plagues of Egypt or the Spanish flu pandemic of 1918, these events have altered the course of human history. It's also well known that the origin of these diseases begins with the transmission of pathogens from animals to humans. Infectious agents that jump from animals to humans are known as zoonotic disease. For example, bird flu originates in wild birds and then moves to domestic poultry and subsequently to humans. This chart illustrates how zoonotic disease moves from uh, common farm animals to humans. Throughout history, the major zoonotic disease includes smallpox, measles, whooping cough, chickenpox, bubonic plague, typhus, and malaria. Before the arrival of Europeans in the Americas in the late 15th century, native people lived in relatively disease-free environments when it came to highly infectious diseases such as smallpox, measles, chickenpox, influenza, typhus, typhoid fever, diphtheria, cholera, bubonic plague, scarlet fever, whooping cough, and malaria. Those zoonotic diseases arose from close contact with domesticated animals like swine and poultry. But other than dogs and llamas, people in North and South America had no experience with raising animals and relied on hunting and fishing as well as growing crops like corn. These populations were also not concentrated in large villages in which zoonotic viruses frequently arise, so there were no opportunities for these infections to come about. This could not be more true of the pandemics introduced to the North and South American continent in the 15th century where smallpox claimed the lives of close to 90% of the population and helped Europeans colonize that region. In fact, if it weren't for the impact of contagious diseases, these continents might have never been successfully colonized. You're probably familiar with the impact of plagues in medieval Europe. The bubonic plague, sometimes referred to as the Black Death, killed up to 60% of the population. A major outbreak of that disease reoccurred roughly every 20 to 30 years with minor outbreaks in between. It took centuries for the world's population to recover from the plague's devastation since it killed a high percentage of the population. It was the largest demographic disaster in European history. Plague had originated in China in 1631 and spread across the trade routes to Western Europe in a series of intermittent epidemics. When it arrived in London, it killed nearly a quarter of London's population in 18 months. In 17th century London, there were outbreaks of bubonic plague in 1603, typhus and smallpox in 1623 and 24. In 1636, plague imported from Holland killed 10,000 in 1636 and returned again the next year. The last major bubonic plague in London lasted from 1665 to 1666, when it was thought that the Great Fire wiped out the rats and fleas that carried the disease. However, smallpox epidemics followed in 1667, 74, and 81, and a typhus epidemic ravaged London in 1685. So you can see 17th century London was frequently dealing with these scourges. So many bodies piled up in London that they had to be buried in mass graves, which were nothing more than large open pits where the bodies were stacked one upon the other. Those bodies remain today under the trees and grass of Charterhouse Square in London, near St. Bartholomew's churchyard. The cause of infectious disease was not known until the mid-19th century, when John Snow studied an outbreak of cholera in 1854 and traced the cause of the outbreak to a single commonly used pump handle. 
This was the beginning of modern epidemiology that uses his technique to map the transmission of disease so it can be contained and stopped. As far as is known, the people in North America had little trouble with contagious diseases prior to the advent of Europeans. According to John Duffy, there is no record of anyone suffering from these diseases prior to the 16th century. So how did these infectious diseases first come to New England in the 17th century? It has been speculated by English settlers that a crew of Frenchmen who had shipwrecked off the coast of Cape Cod had captured and captured by the Nauset Indians may have been responsible for the first outbreak in the early 1600s. Some of the earliest reports of disease occurred along the main coast where French traders had sustained contact with native people, but no one knows for certain. In 1616, Richard Vines had wintered in the Pemquid tribe in Maine, who were then affected with the plague, which may have been smallpox, chickenpox, or hepatitis. Whether this was the origin of what came to be known as the Great Dying along the coast from Maine to Cape Cod between 1616 and 1619, it was widely reported to have killed 90% of the native population. Alfred Crosby, in his virgin soil theory of the 1970s, smallpox epidemics among the Algonquins in 1630 wiped out entire native settlements. While the native population was completely susceptible to contracting these diseases because they had no acquired immunity, even 20 of the English separatists aboard the Mayflower died as a result of smallpox. A subsequent outbreak in 1633 killed another 20 English people and thousands of native people. Smallpox had become the most destructive disease in New England for the rest of the 17th century. Smallpox soon spread to colonial settlements in the Connecticut River Valley in 1634 and then spread throughout the native tribes all the way north to the St. Lawrence River and the Great Lakes into Canada. Author Colin Colloway reported in his book After King Philip's War, smallpox first raged south of the Merrimack River in 1631, but starting in 1633, swept along the St. Lawrence and Connecticut Rivers, disrupting the fur trade and affecting almost all American Indian groups in the Northeast with appalling rates of d death. In the published literature of the time, Roger Williams noted that native people and whole towns would flee those with disease, leaving them the dead unburied. In the years that followed the 1634 outbreak, smallpox returned to New England in 1638, and a particularly virulent form of the contagion inflicted heavy ca casualties among the colonists in 1666, when mild types of infection were passed on to the Indians and then returned to the colonists, it came back as a more malignant form. Thomas Morton described the scene in the native village of Patuxet, which English called Plymouth, when they arrived in 1620. He states, In short time after the hand of God fell heavily upon them, with such a moral stroke that they died in heaps as they lay in their houses. For in a place where many inhabited, there had been but one left alive to tell what became of the rest. And the bones and skulls upon the several places of their habitations made such a spectacle after my coming into these parts, that as I traveled in that forest near the Massachusetts, it seemed to me a new found Golgotha. Indigenous people had seen a strange comet appear over the skies of New England in 1618, and the medicine men interpreted this as confirmation that a terrible sickness would soon overtake the land. They were not wrong as the epidemics that followed span from southern Maine to Narragansett Bay, with the most fatalities in Boston Harbor and Plymouth Bay. The early English colonists had many names for the outbreak, something for which they had been familiar with in England. As historian Jill Lepore notes, a whole village 
might have two survivors, and those two survivors were just not like any two people. They were two people who had seen everyone they know die, miserable, wretched, painful, excruciatingly painful deaths. Though we know the symptoms of the disease, the case for the first great dying in Plymouth being bubonic plague is unconvincing as there were no reports of the telltale swollen lymph nodes, but all attempts to identify the nature of this outbreak remain inconclusive. The Poconoca people saw the cause of the epidemic as a spiritual force, believing that the deity Habamak was angry with them. Some even vowed that they would serve the Englishman's God if they recovered. Others thought the English controlled the epidemic and could inflict it at will on the native population, despite assurances to the contrary by the English. Squanto, the first intermediary between the Poconocuts and the colonists, thought the English stored plague in barrels, which they could use to destroy the tribe. Habamak, who served also as an intermediary between the Massasoit and the colonists, believed that the governor could let out the plague and destroy the sachem and his men, giving him control over the tribe. Though he had survived the great dying and lived to serve as a translator for the English, Squanto eventually died two years later of what was referred to as the Indian disease. The English, on the other hand, were convinced that their mission in America was righteous and that smallpox had cleared the title to the land and continued to make room for their increasing numbers. Even King James I in England subscribed to this idea, writing, Within these late years there hath by God's visitation reigned a wonderful plague, the utter destruction, devastation, and depopulation of that whole territory, so there is not left any that do claim or challenge any kind of interest therein. We in our judgment are persuaded and satisfied that the appointed time has come in which Almighty God, in His great goodness and bounty toward us, and our people have thought fit and determined that those large and goodly territories, deserted as it were by their natural inhabitants, should be possessed and enjoyed by such of our subjects. The great pestilence continued throughout the region, following the 1633 smallpox epidemic, a universal sickness in 1645, the plague and pox of 1650, in the bloody flux of 1652 further weakened the native population. As William Hubbard wrote, sundry diseases weakened the red men in 1676 during the King Philip's War, and further outbreaks in 1688 to 1691 continued to affect the Indians and whites, French and British. The decimation of the American Indian continued at an accelerated speed throughout the 18th century. Had those diseases not occurred, the pilgrims might have not had the cooperation of the Massasoit and his people. If the numbers of the Poconocut people had not continued to diminish, and had their smaller numbers not led to their perceived need for a war to drive out the English, things might have been very different. The coronavirus has raged the United States, but the five million American Indians and Alaskan Natives have been especially vulnerable. In this way, we see that history is indeed repeating itself. Though epidemics, plagues, and pandemics have been around since the dawn of civilization, we are still surprised when they happen. Though we have learned much about pandemics from advances in science, the question is, will we be willing to apply that knowledge to better control future outbreaks? Only time will tell.